wonderful presentation. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dogerty and Comet. We appreciate it. Great, thanks everyone. Uh, hi, my name is Gary Bell. Uh, I'm a data, anal a data analytics architect. Sorry, I'm speaking fast. I had too much caffeine, I think, already today. Um, with Covenant Technology Partners. And so we're gonna talk today about uh, database mirroring in Fabric. Uh, hopefully at this point, everyone's uh, familiar with uh, Microsoft Fabric. At some point, we're gonna we'll level set here uh, in a moment uh, in terms of kind of what that is. Is, it, is anyone using Fabric yet? Is anybody actually kind of implemented at some degree in their in, uh, environment? Um, yeah. Uh, that's great. It's great to see that, that we've got a couple here. Um, and you know, it's it's. Uh, how about just Power BI? Anybody using Power BI? If I, I figure we've got more Power BI users, yeah. So um, we'll get into this in a moment um, uh, in more detail. But I was just kind of curious in terms of an agenda. Uh, here's kind of the way I want to kind of run through this today. We'll just talk about some high-level industry kind of challenges. Uh, how Fabric might uh, uh, address some of those. We'll jump into um, how you actually get data over into uh, the fabric environment, specifically this one lake uh, that we'll talk about uh, within fabric that kind of underpins everything uh, that that fabric really enables for your organization. And then we'll we'll jump into the mirroring and and, and talk about kind of what this is and the benefits of it and and uh, use cases, et cetera. And for the most part here, we're we're going to just jump into demo. I'm gonna. I'm gonna uh, try to try to do this as live a demo as as I can, uh, which which certainly means that it's gonna fail spectacularly on me, unfortunately, probably. But um, I, I do have a bit of a backup environment if, if we struggle. But uh, I want to show you guys how easy this is to set up. If, if fingers crossed, if this, this thing cooperates with us, um, we should be able to completely, you know, you know, within a half an hour or so here, uh, kind of walk you through the entire process and uh and show you what this looks like uh in kind of real world scenario here um and then we'll get into some some questions and, and stuff that typically come up when, when we start talking about this and and then talk about kind of roadmap uh for the future because again this is this is a preview feature still in in fabric um it, it rolled out here earlier this year um so it's it's maybe just a few months uh it's it's been in, in public preview <clears throat> so we're still kind of early days here again um not not completely um, rolled out for um, general availability, but everyone that has a fabric environment uh, should be able to get in and play with this uh, in the public preview. So off we go. Um, so, you know, I feel like we, we ought to just uh, level set here in terms of uh, industry. Again, this is a, it's a pretty generic uh, slide in terms of the, the challenges uh, that we're facing up here, right? These are not, um, these are these are uh, problems that just about every organization is going to have to some degree uh, somewhere in the organization, from the trillion dollar company like like Microsoft to the smallest of the of any of the firms here that any of us work or, or work for or work work with. Um, so pretty uh, pretty ubiquitous in terms of, uh, and I, I think I would imagine that most of you would kind of nod your head that the organization. Um, could check, you know, probably all four of these boxes, frankly. Um, so these are these are pretty generic. They're not they're not new either, right? I'm mean, I, I pretty I, I could have pretty easily borrowed this slide from you know probably 15 years ago, and um, and a lot of the same challenges would have been there. In fact, for all of these same challenges would have been there. So in one sense, it's a little maybe disappointing that um, that we haven't uh, come farther uh, in solving some of these, um, but it's, it's certainly true that our the, the tool sets that we have and the methodology that we have uh, to address these has has come a long way within that time. Uh, and fabric being an, uh, the latest example of of how we can deal with those. Unfortunately, I think the the variety, the volume, the the um, velocity, the the three three the, the traditional three big V's of uh, uh, V's of big data, uh, if you recall that. Um, have kind of kept pace with us, unfortunately, right? We've got a lot more sources coming from a lot more places. The data is coming in more rapidly. We're collecting more of it. So, on one hand, the the tools are getting better. On the other hand, the data is getting better, and we're we're kind of still, you know, kind of treading water. I think in a lot of ways, uh, in terms of uh, in, uh, trying to solve for a lot of these issues. So, um, 
So certainly not there yet, uh, but Microsoft feels like fabric. Uh, it's fabric environment. Uh, it's fabric uh, service. I guess it's a, it, it is a software as a service model uh, platform can help address a lot of these challenges. So well, it's not like we got a couple people that are using fabric already. For those that aren't, uh, this is kind of the 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 generic slide or the the, the preeminent slide that that kind of walks you through the various. Um, what they call personas or workloads in in Microsoft Fabric. So Fabric, as you may know, is, is kind of an evolution of or really an extension of the Power BI uh, service uh, that Microsoft's had out for uh, for a number of years now. And so when you think about Power BI, it's a it's a very software as a service model, right? There are no, no servers to manage. There's no hardware infrastructure, that kind of stuff. It's just you you, you load up your data and, and off you go. And so they've kind of extended that here. Uh, across a variety of these other workloads, specifically like the the ETL tools, and, and if you think of like Data Factory, uh, if anyone's used that in Azure, they kind of roll that in here. We've got machine learning and AI workloads that you can you can pull in data engineering. So you've got your your data warehousing that you might have previously done if you're doing it in the cloud in a uh, tool like Synapse. So they pull that in into the software as a service model, um, as well as of course Power BI is still there. And we've got some other things around real-time analytics, and this the final one is data activator, which is a service around uh, data alerting. Uh, in, in case you wanted to um, create things of that nature, and so what underpins all of this, uh, that kind of highlighted uh, bar there in, in the bottom middle, is the one lake. <clears throat> so one lake, the um, the 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 problem they're trying to solve there is 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 pull all of your data together. You can you can bring in your your SQL data. Uh, your unstructured data, your data from other uh, third party systems uh, and land it all in one lake uh, and then have that single version of the data. Uh, connect to all these various systems, uh, various workloads, I should call them. Uh, and so if you think uh, about your organization, I, I'm, I'm sure that you all have uh, people in your organization that are doing uh, uh, any number of these things, right? You've got people that are that are doing ETL processes to move data around, and maybe they're using Informatica to do that, or maybe they're using SQL Server uh, uh, integration services. Whatever it is, they've got a tool set to do that. You've got uh, uh, you probably have some people doing data warehousing. Maybe they're doing that on SQL Server or some other kind of a, a, a platform, uh, Snowflake or, or Databricks, something like that, potentially even. Um, of course, you've got reporting in Power BI, uh, but the, the concept here is that um, we're going to pull all of those things together, put them into one uh, managed tool set, uh, underpin them all with, with a consistent uh, single version of your data in the one lake, and allow them to share that data across these various workloads in a managed uh, environment uh, where you can manage security and, and access and things like that uh, all in one place. So it the the vision for this is that it greatly simplifies that uh, the complexity of that modern data environment uh, out in this cloud based service. Um, any questions about fabric specifically before we jump in? And again, I know people uh, have various levels of exposure here. OK, so. One lake's great uh, and fabric's great if you can get your data in one lake and, and, and I mean, I should jump back here. You don't have to have your data in one lake for a lot of these uh, services to work. Power BI is a great example, right? You guys, uh, it sounds like nearly all use Power BI. You can get data into Power BI from any number of places. Um, I will say though, Power BI, um, what it's doing behind the scenes is essentially sucking your data into the one lake uh, via the Power BI, you know, the Power Query uh, component of Power BI. Uh, but it it kind of obfuscates that from you. But, um, but in order to really light up this environment and 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 achieve the full power of it. You need data. You need that data to get into the one lake. So, what does that process look like? Uh, you have some options here, and, and data factory would probably be the um, the workload or the persona that that is typically associated with with kind of your ETL activities where you push data into uh, the one lake. The one lake itself, uh, I should say, is. Um, is a, is a common format. That format is a parquet file. Parquet file is a open source uh, big data. Um, uh, file format uh, that is, you know, is pretty standard now across again some of the, the the technologies that I mentioned a moment ago, like Snowflake and and uh, Databricks, etc. 
uh, and then more specifically, uh, what we're using in uh, in the one lake is what they call a delta enabled parquet file. And the, the difference there, without getting into a lot of detail about uh, about the the tech stack, is that uh, the uh, the delta enabled uh, parquet files allow for your add, update, delete uh, kind of crud operations that you would typically associate with a, a database platform. A standard parquet file is is just additive. Basically, you you kind of just Create new parquet files and et cetera. But so the Delta enabled parquet files is the common format that exists in that uh, one lake uh, environment. So to get data into one lake, we need Delta enabled parquet files. How do we create Delta enabled parquet files? Again, we can use something like Data Factory. Uh, there's a couple options in Data Factory and in, in, in uh, Fabric. Uh, the two there are the, the Data Flow Gen 2, what this looks like. Uh, again, a lot of Power BI. Um, uh, uh, familiarity uh, in the crowd. Uh, a data flow gen 2 looks like Power Query. So if you've ever written Power Query, you know, you pop up the little transform data button in, in Power BI. Uh, that's what uh, a data flow gen 2 looks like uh, in Fabric in the cloud. You open it up the, the window. In fact, we can peek at one later if you want to see it. Uh, but it looks almost identical to uh, Power Query in um, in Power BI. The difference being you you Pull in your data from a source, you apply all the steps over on the right hand side that you're used to. And then at the end of that, uh, whereas in Power BI, that just goes into a table in your Power BI semantic model. In a data flow gen 2, you get to add a destination. Uh, there's a little, you know, kind of final step in the bottom right corner. And you can tell it that once you've done all these different transformations, what do I want to do with that data? Do I want to put it into an Azure SQL database or uh, in order to get data into our one lake, into these Delta enabled parquet files? You'd want to put it into a uh, in in fabric terms, what they call a warehouse uh, or a uh, lake house out in uh, out of fabric, and by doing that, it converts the files, it it creates the delta enabled parquet files, and uh, and loads data in the data lake. So that's one way to do it. The data pipelines are are familiar to those of you who've used Data Factory in um, in Azure in the past. Again, that so that experience has largely been ported over into uh, fabric as well. Um, so that maybe looks a little more familiar to people that that have done uh, integration services in the past. It's a it's a orchestration kind of a, a tool there. Um, but you can uh, I, I, you know, there are different reasons to use both, but it, essentially, again, at the end of the day, you're going to end up with. Delta enabled parquet files written into your. Um, into your one lake, so. Those are just two ways to kind of to get the data over there. Now, if you already have Delta enabled parquet files from some other system, um, uh, you, you're, you're, uh, you can easily copy those in and, and then kind of start using them as well. But uh, largely, though, if, if you're if you're thinking about pulling data from a from a source system, and we'll just use SQL Server as our example today, um, because that's what we're going to show a demo of here in a bit. Um, if you're thinking about pulling that data in uh, and kind of maintaining the the um, the sync of that data uh, with with what's in your source system. So uh, uh, traditionally, what we would have done, uh, what we would do, is write a, an ETL process. And I'm sure that it would, throughout your organizations, you all have nightly ETL processes that run that go and query a source database and and uh, and pull that data forward um, and bring it into maybe some kind of reporting database, a data warehouse. Uh, there's probably some transformation, right? The T in our ETL. Uh, where you maybe massage it around or do some things with it, and then we load it into our warehouse environment. Again, those are uh, processes that I would say is it's typically run on a nightly basis uh, uh, where we schedule those things because they typically take a fair amount of time to run and they can be fairly burdensome on the source system. So if we've got a OLTP database that's out and processing orders all day, we don't want to put a big load on it uh, to pull to pull content out of it uh, on a regular basis for reporting. So when we write those processes, um, you've got a couple options, right? You can you can do a full truncate and reload if you're pulling data over into your warehouse or reporting database. Uh, this, by the way, is the way Power BI operates natively when you refresh your, your data set in Power BI, uh, unless you've taken the time to set up something like incremental refresh, it will just Clear out your, let's say, your sales table, uh, your orders table, and and um, wipe it away, and then reload it from scratch. Um, 
from a simplicity or a, for, from a complexity standpoint, that's certainly the easiest way to do it uh, because you don't have to write any of the other logic that figures out what's new and what's what needs to be updated, what needs to be deleted. Um, but it's obviously expensive in terms of uh, the amount of data you have to load. Because if you've got a big data set, you have to reload, you know, 99% of it probably every night that hasn't really changed. Um, but then you can, you know, if you um, if you want to take the time to to um, to build the logic, you can do more of an incremental or a load changes only kind of approach, where you figure out what's new, um, you know, kind of write that merge logic that figures out, uh, uh, kind of compares the records coming in to the records that are already there, and and so that's certainly doable. And that's some something that um, that I know I've built plenty of uh, examples of uh, over the years. It's a, it's burdensome to to set it up initially because there's a lot of work to do there uh, to to kind of figure out the <clears throat> excuse me figure out the keys that, that need to be matched on and things like that, um, and um, uh, just you know depending on how many tables you have to set it up it can it can take quite a bit of time. It's also uh, kind of a pain to kind of keep it uh, synced up with the source database. If new columns get created, new tables get created, we've got additional. ETL pipelines we have to create to kind of keep that data in sync uh, across platforms. So, um, so those are some kind of some of the challenges, right? So I think you guys uh, kind of see where we're headed here in terms of the mirroring that could potentially solve a lot of these kind of issues. Um, so, uh, mirroring in SQL Server again. This is a it's in public preview. It's been out for a few months. Um, the the promise here is that you can you can connect your source database, and and we've got three three options uh, currently uh, you can see down there at the bottom we can we can do an azure sql database we could do a snowflake environment uh, or a uh, an azure cosmos db and we'll talk about other options here in a bit as well um but the promise here is that uh you can mirror your database and the, the one that we're going to focus on today is the azure sql database uh turn on uh database mirroring into fabric and really with a with a slip of a button here um the fabric environment excuse me the fabric environment takes care of the rest it manages all that back and forth figuring out what's changed what's uh what's new what's what's updated and it streams those those changes uh i'm going to use the term stream lightly uh because it's more like a slightly uh you know uh delayed uh stream um but it streams those changes out to Azure, out to Fabric specifically, and, and more specifically than that, out to One Lake. Um, so as a new uh, a transaction is added to your uh, source table in your in your source system, in this case our Azure SQL database, uh, within a few minutes uh, at most, uh, in most cases, uh, that that record has found its way out to the the One Lake version, uh, uh, this Delta in a Delta enable parquet file. This one lake version of our uh, of our source database, and so now you don't have the problem of running that big nightly uh, export uh, or a nightly you know kind of sync job that uh, ETL process that that sends data out into your reporting environment. Um, the uh, the process itself is very low overhead. I'll talk about kind of exactly what it's doing behind the scenes here in a moment, but there's very little. Um, very little burden on your uh, source system, uh, so you're not running big, expensive, you know, select all the records that have, you know, processed today or even, you know, the entire table. Uh, so you shouldn't get in the way of any um, OLTP processing, for example, on your on your source system. And again, zero ETL. I've, I've got it highlighted there. It's 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 um, it's really. Um, it's hard to overstate that and kind of and if you think about the the implications of that having a kind of a real time mirror so the, the concept of mirroring obviously isn't new in fact some of your organizations may use uh mirroring or something similar to mirroring a couple different options on the on the sql server side for example to create a kind of a read only uh, uh copy of your uh of your uh of like an oltp system uh for reporting purposes so the concept is similar here uh, the difference being that instead of taking that over to maybe another SQL instance um, uh, for reporting purposes uh, on-prem, we're taking that, we're lifting it out, we're putting it out in, in the cloud, we're specifically translating it into these uh, Delta-enabled Parquet files on the one lake, and then uh, that 
feeds into all these other uh, use cases, these workloads in fabric uh, that you see there across the top again. And so um, uh, again, you can have, as the example shows up here, maybe we've got uh, our finance data. And uh, if you follow the path there, uh, they just show the finance data being uh, manipulated or maybe queried with, uh, with T-SQL and maybe uh, put into or, or queried from a, a data warehouse. But you could just as easily take that same finance data and maybe do some data science stuff on it if you've got some some people that really want to uh, go to town on that and, and throw some ML models at it, for example. Um, or of course, you could connect it directly to Power BI for reporting, any number of things. But again, we've got the one version of it and it, and it can feed into all of these uh, various, um, various workloads. Again, the mirroring itself, uh, we're going to we're going to go through the demo here in a bit. Super simple to set up, and it takes care of all the rest. It's like the set it and forget it kind of button. You click it on, um, get it set up, and off it goes. Uh, it's smart enough, as we'll we'll show in our demo, is smart enough to um, respond to DDL changes. So if you've added a column uh, to one of your database uh, tables, um, it's smart enough to pull that through on its own. Uh, if you turn on the option. It's smart enough to um, to pick up new tables altogether. So if you've added a, a, a new table altogether in your source system, um, and again, and you've enabled the option, it will automatically uh, sync itself up and, and make its way over to the one like as, as well. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit more in a little more depth. And I promise we're not going to do a whole lot more slides here. I want to want to get into the actual demo here in a second. Um, talk a little bit more about. About the way this works under under the hood. So, is anyone familiar with uh, change data capture in SQL Server? Anybody use that at all? So, excuse me again. Um, this is going to use. Um, it's, we're, we're jumping, uh, by the way, into the specific SQL Server um, use case here. As I mentioned, you can do Cosmos DB or, or Snowflake right now as well. Um, so, we're specifically jumping over into just SQL Server, and so. Uh, from a SQL Server standpoint, the way this works is very similar to change data capture. If you know anything about change data capture, it's a service that runs on your, your SQL environment. It, it turns on some, some various uh, or kind of enables some various store procedures that kind of run in the background. And essentially it works by monitoring the transaction log. And that's that's how this um, this operates as well. Um, so it's so it's very low, uh, first of all, low latency, but second of all, low impact in terms of uh, uh, performance on your on your SQL environment. Uh, so it scans in the background the transaction logs, and that's how it figures out what's new, uh, what's added. Uh, I'm sorry, what's what's updated, what's been deleted, and it takes that that you know that log of of information, and it and it pushes it out in near real time, out into um, out into the one lake again. Uh, the uh, process is managed fully in Fabric, um, and so it takes that, pulls it up, and figures out what to do with those transactions as they come in. We'll show what that looks like in terms of monitoring that and, and what it looks like, what's going on there. Um, so, so that's how it works. Um, we'll get in. Uh, I'll, I'll get into some some of the requirements and, and limitations here in a moment, but. Um, I guess I, sh I should have pointed out as well, and it, it shows there at the top uh, that once you have it in uh, in the one lake, um, you know you have all those various workload options that are that are available to you. But the, one of the first things it does natively is it is it exposes a uh, SQL endpoint. Um, so even though the data is is stored in those Parquet files, you're going to get a SQL engine or a, a SQL endpoint that's going to look like any other SQL connection that you've ever connected to. In fact, we can use any. SQL enabled tools to connect to it. So you can hook up Management Studio or you can hook up Excel or any, any number of other things that, that can basically connect to and query a SQL database and write typical SQL statements against it. Um, again, it's not at that point, the data is not technically in a in a SQL uh, database. The format of the underlying data is, is significantly different, et cetera, et cetera. But because of that, uh, that SQL engine that sits on top of it, um, you can treat it as such. You can treat it as a, as a normal uh, database in terms of querying it. So uh, I'm going to jump right into the demo. I've got a few of the, so I'm kind of kind of go back and forth here because I know this this process takes a few minutes to kind of to get going. So I'm going to get it started here. We're going to take a look at it, and then we'll probably jump back while we're waiting for it to 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 get going. Um, we'll jump back in here and go through a few of the. Um, 
like the prereqs and and some of the limitations, things like that, while we're waiting for it. But let me go ahead and um, fix this up here. OK, so when I say we're starting from scratch, I'm really going to start from scratch. I'm just going to go create a new workspace for this and I'm just going to call it. Just call it database mirroring. Oops, I'm searching for. It. Um, in terms of requirements here, you do need uh, some kind of a fabric capacity associated with your workspace. So again, if, if you're familiar with with Power BI, uh, you might be familiar with a few of the other licensing models that are here. You've got a pro license or a premium capacity or a premium per user. If you have a premium capacity for fabric or for for Power BI, um, you have fabric. Uh, they've they've taken all the previous uh, premium uh, Power BI capacities and and basically converted them over, well, it's not a straight conversion. They're, they're going to force you to kind of move to a fabric capacity sometime soon. But the feature wise, uh, if you had a P1 capacity in, in, in Power BI, for example, you have access to, uh, to all the fabric features. Now, your admin may have to turn some of those things on, uh, but that's out there. Otherwise, um, and, and, and regardless, at some point, you're going to have to convert that over to a, to a fabric capacity, which are similar, but we've got some lower levels to work with there that make the, the barrier to entry here a little easier. Um, but you do need to assign it. Uh, you need to have your workspace assigned to a fabric capacity. Um, I've got one here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to select that uh, as part of my, um, my creation process here and let it start up our new our new capacity um so uh there are a few prereqs i'll show you how to enable here in a moment uh but i want to just get this other thing started and, and again we'll, we'll circle back so in order to to set up uh database mirroring um you're just going to go up here to the to the new and and you're going to click on more options to, to jump down to the all the different things in fabric that you have access to now again i don't know if anyone's enabled fabric in their environment or played around with it We'll go through some of these maybe a little later, but um, but you know you've got you, you down here at the very bottom. These are your standard Power BI things, reports and semantic models and things like that. But you've got all these other you know those workloads that we had or those personas we had up there in the diagram earlier. Uh, they map to these various um, various items we can do here, and the one we're specifically looking at is under the data warehouse heading, and it's this mirrored Azure SQL database. So we're going to jump right in. Um, and connect to a Azure SQL database. Let me see if I can find. It's not what I'm Well, I think I remember it. All right, so I have an Azure uh, SQL uh, database uh, running out in Azure, of course. Um, it just re it remembered this connection here, but if you go back here for a moment, um, you put in the server name, uh, you put in the database, and then it, it asks you how you want to connect. Uh, you have have kind of the typical options here. I'm just going to use a, a SQL username and password. But if you've got a you know a service principal assigned, or you want to use your organization account, those are both options as well. Um, but again, in my case, it just, uh, I've connected to this before, so it's remembering that. So anyway, you, you uh, connect. Uh, it should go out and find our database and find the tables that are associated with it. Uh, 
at some point. Here we go. All right, so I've got a pretty simple uh, uh, little kind of demo database that I've stood up out here. It's got some basic information around order, kind of header and detail, some customers. Um, in fact, that's, let me do one other thing here. It's got a table in there that I wanted to get rid of. I'm going to create that one here in a moment. Um, but you saw, uh, it, you know, list of the tables. Um, you can select all of them, of course. Um, and then you see this option down here at the bottom, automatically mirror tables from um, any future tables that may show up. I, I mentioned that option. So you have that ability. Of course, you know, you can, you can sub-select if you just wanted to, um, you know, select a couple tables. You're certainly uh, able to do that in some of your larger OLTP systems. Uh, that may make a lot of sense because there's probably a lot of junk out there you don't care about for reporting purposes. Um, so you may want to sub select there, but if you select all, you can also turn on that option to um, to mirror future tables. Um, and I'm going I'm to go ahead and enable that as well, so we can show that in action here in a moment. Uh, in terms of limitations here, I should mention um, that um, and I don't have an example of this right now, but there are certain data types um, that aren't fully supported here. If you've got some of your maybe your more um more uh, obscure sql data types like uh, geometry data points or um i think like your in text or image data types those kind of things they'll they, they will give you a warning on things like that and it just it'll it'll mean that it'll it'll sync everything other than those some of those data types uh so if you've got just one column in a table that that doesn't work it should still sync the rest the other thing that that I kind of find, found out here in playing with this. Um, uh, they claim that it supports tables uh, without primary keys. Again, if you've worked with change data capture before, change data capture requires uh, tables to, to have a primary key if you're going to track changes on it. Um, this uh, this mirroring claims to be able to, to, to take care of tables that do not have a, a proper primary key defined. Um, but I didn't have a whole lot of luck with those. It seemed to kind of confuse it a little bit. And and so I would just say kind of buyer beware uh, on that. Uh, be careful uh, and, and kind of test that out properly. In my case, I, I went ahead and, and created uh, primary keys on all these tables just to make sure that it was it was uh, pretty straightforward. And that's really it. Um, we select that, we give it a quick name, um, and then um, and then off we go. Um, so at this point, it does take uh, a little bit of time, and I've cut down the size of my sample database is, is fairly small. I think the biggest table has a few thousand records in it. Um, obviously, if you have a, a big giant uh, database, you know, that's uh, got, you know, millions of rows in it, the time to take for this initial sync uh, could be somewhat lengthy. I don't have a great amount of uh, uh, guidance uh, there for you, but just understand that uh, that initial sync could take some time. Uh, in terms of monitoring it, you can kind of see what's going on here. It says the, it's starting the, the synchronization process or the um, the service basically to, to kind of get that up. And now it says it's running. And then this is uh, where we can monitor the replication. Um, so I'm going to click this. We're probably not going to see much. Yeah. Zero. Well, almost zero. Well, I'll show you a couple of things. But yeah, unlike something like change data capture, where you've got to run a bunch of procedures to turn on uh, the CDC functions, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's all taken care of for you. There's a, there's a couple of tiny little security things that we'll talk about here in a moment, but no. And it's all based on the transaction log and the transaction log is logging all the time. You don't have to turn that on. So, so no, it's, it's good to go. Um, Obviously, the more it, and that it could have more to do with the size of your fabric capacity, you know, because there is a there is a load there, of course. Um, but uh, there's no hard limits on on how much data can come through. Again, because it's the transaction log, uh, transactions don't hit there until they've been committed. So if you've got a bunch of stuff that runs things in um, in sessions and doesn't commit until the end, or you've got a big giant uh, insert or something like that that's saving up a bunch of things, it could. Kind of overwhelm it for a time but it's like a lot of these um 
uh, synchronization uh, uh, technologies, it'll just kind of pool up and kind of you know, so it, you may have a period of time where it gets pretty busy and it kind of spools it out. So you, you you're just your your synchronization time may may lengthen there if, if you get um, if you get kind of stuck. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. The online question is about separate indexes. So do we have to build the in, rebuild the indexes on the mirror database, or does it automatically come over when it's mirrored? Yeah, you're not going to. So again, this is not a uh, SQL database. That you're 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 not mirroring SQL to SQL. You're mirroring SQL to one link. So you're not. Um, you don't get the indexes, and it's just a, it's a different. It's a columnar uh, structure that that gets written in these in these parquet files, but there's no indexing uh, that's that's associated with it. So, yeah, the management of you know you can query it like a regular SQL Server. Everything under the hood is not SQL Server from a storage standpoint. So yeah, you you don't have the indexes and keys and all those kind of things. Yeah, Gary. I mentioned something about the parquet part and, and the way it is organized for performance, so that indexing is. Not really. Yeah, I will say. Uh, I mean, there's obviously going to be situations where querying a, a delta, you know, a delta enabled parquet file, you know, you know that structure, um, you may not get same performance that you would out of a, a, a finely tuned SQL query. But for the most part, again, it's a column columnar column store um, uh, format, and so for reporting kind of workloads, it it works very well. Uh, in fact, it's the same technology to really that that. Power BI is is kind of based on or built on top of. So again, familiarity with Power BI, you know how quickly Power BI can answer a lot of those questions as you're filtering or or, or querying the data in Power BI. So it's a very similar uh, kind of approach under the hood. Um, so so yes, typically for performance, uh, for reporting performance, reporting query performance, um, more of your aggregate kind of stuff, um, queries against this format perform very very well. Again, I wouldn't structure your data this way if you're, you know, if you're trying to build an application on top of it and you're writing row and row after row after row of, of individual data. The the delta portion of the of the parquet file starts to kind of build up over time, and it, it gets a little. Um, you can think of it like as a fragmented index in a lot of ways. Um, so there's a cleanup that would need to occur. So it's, again, that's not the best use case for it, but. Um, but for the, the kind of stuff that we're talking about here traditionally in, in fabric, it works very well. All right, maybe you guys let me talk long enough that we've got some results here. We'll see. Oh, look what we did. Um, and I, I could have uh, been refreshing. It, it's not it's not live, so you kind of got to refresh it. But you, you see here, so we, we've synced these databases, uh, or these tables rather. Uh, he shows he shows the four tables. You see, again, the, the, the biggest one I have is the order lines. It's got about 10,000 rows in it. Uh, it's synced though, so you can see right away the number of rows that have been replicated the last time uh, it it ran, which is a few minutes ago here. And now um, it's just kind of sitting and waiting uh, for changes to occur. Um, before we get to that, let's just kind of look at at, at what's um, what's popped up here, uh, kind of in our environment um, as we've as we've talked here. Let's clean all these up. that one okay so uh just in uh in creating that mirrored database you see we created the wide world importers mirrored database uh and right out of the box or right away you you get two kind of associated items here we get that sql endpoint sql analytics endpoint that i mentioned uh we'll look at that and then you get a default semantic model uh, that you could immediately start building Power BI reports uh, against, and we'll look at that as well. But just to, to start here at the endpoint, um, again, this is a, just a essentially kind of a, a query tool or a, like a SQL management studio kind of view of your data. You see we've got our schemas and our tables here. So these are the four tables that brought over. You could see the, um, the data that's in them. Um, we can write SQL queries against them. So, you know, select um, from G 
just find the new orders, oops, order date greater than Um, and we can run these and type something wrong. Oh. But you can see we thought it was order date. Oh, is it going to be case sensitive one? So apparently that's one idiosyncrasy of the SQL here is that it's, it's case sensitive in terms of the names, which is uh, not typically your um, your typical SQL uh, uh, behavior. But again, we can write typical SQL statements uh, against this um, uh, to query this data. And as you can see, it, it returns pretty quickly. Um, so again, uh, there's our data. Uh, we've got, um, if we jump back, over to the uh, kind of the main view here, we've got a reporting tab. Um, we're gonna I'm gonna just click to automatically update our semantic model. It's gonna pull these four tables in there. Um, kind of to manage this default model, um, we'll jump over here, and again, this is just like uh, you would do in in uh, in Power BI. Uh, where you can create the relationships here, and let's just create a few of the default relationships. Let's see, uh, order ID to our uh, many, and then uh, And then a customer ID. Um, a couple of the things of note here, or one other important thing to note, you, you kind of see the, um, the little icon there. It's, that's, that's supposed to be their direct lake icon. So um, I think I've talked about this in a past session, but in uh, this, uh, other this direct lake technology in in fabric is is another big uh, innovation in terms of uh, power bi and power bi performance so i mentioned i think earlier that um that this delta enabled parquet uh, column or storage is very uh, similar to the way power bi stores its data it's similar enough uh in fact that uh power bi is uh is uh, included this what they call direct lake uh connection uh technology now as one of your options when you pull data into into Power BI. So if you remember, uh, traditionally in Power BI, we've had kind of import mode where it takes data and pulls it into your Power BI semantic model. You've had a um, a um, uh, oh, I forget what, what do they call the, the, the just a direct query direct query. I'm sorry, you've had direct query mode, which takes the the queries that are generated by your uh, Power BI and passes them right back to the source system. So SQL Server in in, in our case here. It would just translate those back and pull it in real time. This direct lake uh, is kind of like direct query mode in that uh, it's querying the underlying source. And, and the, the difference now is that the underlying source is these Delta enabled parquet files in our one lake. We've just created them here in a mirrored environment. And so now what's really, and, and this is kind of the, the full, you know, the full picture that uh, kind of completes the loop here. Not only do we have our data streaming out to one lake, um, but it, drops it uh, and puts it in that format that we need. And now we can connect uh, Power BI directly to our one lake and we get real-time changes as they come in. So uh, the, the example here is some orders. So as an order is entered into your OLTP system uh, within the matter of a couple minutes that it takes to, to stream over to one lake and make itself available here, it is immediately available uh, in your Power BI uh, model uh, assuming you've you've built a model using this direct lake technology without any need to process, you know, you, you've got a Power BI refresh that you're probably familiar with. If you've done a lot of Power BI work, you know, typically would schedule those to run a few times a day or overnight to kind of keep that data fresh. You don't even need to do that anymore. The data comes uh, into your OLTP. It 
mirrors itself out to one link. And then, you know, in most cases, the next time you pull up the Power BI report or hit refresh, there it is. Yeah. Is there a specific time delay? It's that like a 15 second refresh that it's running the back. Or you, I'm going to give you the consultant's answer, right? And it depends. Um, but uh, I, I think the documentation says, um, like, as, as much as two to five minutes, but they're kind of covering themselves there. I think in most cases, I've seen it 30 seconds or less. Um, so it's pretty quick. Again, near real time, not instant, right? It's not, um, but um, it's scanning the transaction log like CDC does, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But again, the, the the overhead there is is now instead of just CDC just writes its data into its own little tables in SQL Server. Right now, we've got to take that data and push it out to the cloud. There's some latency there, and uh, it's got to transform that data into this parquet file. So it's a little bit of latency there. So there are a few other things going, a few extra pieces that have to have to take place. But in terms of you know what you have to do in order to make it available for reporting, I mean this is. This is dead simple, right? I mean, we turn on mirroring, we build a semantic model, we build a report, and then we have fresh data. Yeah. Import. Oh, it's like Power BI. You, the data gets transformed and, and compressed so that it's very performant. And that directly to the power, that the Delta Parquet. Uh, file format is a similar to compression mm -hmm. format. Yep. So that you're getting the same performance without having to go through an import. So because this is near real time, you can connect in direct query mode, query the data link without having to go through any sort of import or refresh schedule or anything like that. Yeah, again, and you think about the, the time is saved here, right? I mean, uh, by, by enabling the mirroring, we've uh, eliminated that that usually costly, expensive overnight sync process from your source system out into your reporting environment, right? That big ETL process that I think most of you will probably have running, you know, at midnight every night to, to try to keep those databases uh, lined up. So we get rid of that. And we also, you know, typically the, the, the step after that, we pull it into some kind of a data warehouse. And then typically you've got a Power BI um, uh, report or model rather that sits on top of that. You've got to refresh that Power BI model. Um, so we've, you know, essentially eliminated both of those big extensive expensive kind of batch jobs that run on a nightly basis and instead we're kind of streaming it out as Gary said we're we're transforming it kind of in real time uh, into that into that format that power bi can use and and then we can point our power bi reports right to it so yeah since you mentioned about the so is there, does it work very similar to how data risk stuff works? Is it you like write it to a storage account and then is that where do we have access to view that? Um, I don't know if there's like a CRC and JSON files that we get to see. And it's a, again, it's a, it's a parquet file. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a binary file. It's not something you can open up like a JSON file and look at and say, oh, there's my record kind of thing. It's it's much more condensed and 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 uh, compressed than that. You can absolutely uh, have access to the files. It's a, there's a, I could show you here in a bit where you can go and get the the link to the to essentially if, if you're familiar with like uh, Azure Blob Storage, it's it's contained in an Azure Blob a, a Gen two Azure Blob Storage account um, that's sitting out there. So yeah, any other tools that can that can read uh, Delta enabled Parquet files, you can plug right into that, and that's essentially what all those different workloads are. They're, they're just different tool sets that can sit on top of and read um, read those files. So let's just build a quick report uh, on top of this data um, and just look uh, and see what it looks like. Again, this is all um, this is essentially, by the way, I think where everything's is headed, right? And this is Power BI Desktop in in the cloud this is power bi desktop in fabric um so let's just take the order date uh and then we'll get the order quantity here let me do that so kind of an ugly chart here uh right off the bat but um this is our you know order quantity by day for the past what three years or something like that uh, that we just pulled in and synced up now let's do something else here let's take this and let's just filter it down to the last few days 
uh, and just kind of keep an eye on this. So we're gonna add some data here and just show you how, how it comes over uh, automatically. So we've got a sum of what, 555 on today's date, the 10th. So I've just got a quick uh, script here that's going to add some records. So I'm just gonna run this a few times and add some uh, orders for today. All right, so we've just added, I don't know, five or six orders with, and their associated line items. Um, so um, let's pop back here to, let's save this for a second. Um, just gonna save that so we can jump right back to it, but I wanted to go back to the monitoring uh, tab here in our, um, Back on our mirror database, we can go back to monitor our, our replication. And I didn't. So here in a moment, again, just kind of testing how long this takes, you'll see these. Um, this last completed update. There it goes, it just went. So I don't remember what those counts were a second ago, but you can see that the timestamp on this is has um, has just incremented up. By the way, it's smart enough to know which tables to kind of look at. So it's kind of polling in the background for changes. Um, uh, it's smart enough to start to learn, for example, your orders table is pretty high velocity, right? There's a lot of changes coming into it. You've got new records every every so often. So I'm gonna pull that one more often, but your customer table, you don't get a lot of new customers. So we're just gonna pull that one maybe less frequently. It's it's smart enough to do that. And it kind of learns that over time to some degree. Uh, all right, so it's, it's uh, that new data is there. Again, I haven't done anything. Uh, anything at all. Uh, so we'll just jump back to our report uh, and we'll just refresh that and there are new orders. Um, so again, the, the next time somebody uh, reloaded that report, uh, refreshed that report, uh, the data is already there and available for analysis uh, there in real time. Um, so just a couple other examples here. Um, we can add a new, well, let's just Let's add a column here to our customer table. Um, but let's see if I still have that there. So I'm just going to add a new customer flag to our. Um, ah, shoot, I forgot to get rid of it. First of all, well, let's add a second new customer flag then. I forgot to clear out my script before I ran this. Um, We're going to add new customer two. We're going to set a value for a couple or all the records. Um, now this one, because I um, I added the flag. Well, first of all, I should say, anytime you add a column, um, change the DDL of a table, um, essentially it has to redo that sync. So be careful there a little bit. If you've done that to a table, one of your really big tables, it took a really long time to, um, to sync, uh, that could be problematic for you. It could could take a while to sync that over uh, because again, it's, it's, it's while it handles these DDL changes, um, it does so on a fairly rudimentary basis, right? It, it basically does that truncate and, and reload uh, approach that we used before. Not a big deal when I only have 600 records or something like that. Um, but kind of the same thing here. First of all, if we jump back over here, all right, you'll notice right now, I don't have that, mm, where's the new customer? Oh, so I've got, I just created new customer two. So new customer uh, two is not there yet. Uh, but if I jump back over to that monitoring tab again, we can check to see what it's up to. Um, we're looking for, waiting for this customer one to update uh, from 1239 to 1258 or something like that. There it goes. And so now again, as soon as we pull this thing back up, um what we should see here if we refresh is new customer two on there as well didn't pull it up yet well it's making a liar out of me oh there it is new customer two so we could take that throw that on and then you know start selecting it against filtering the data right away as well um, one other quick 
example, we'll create a new, uh, where's my new table? So we're going to add a quick calendar kind of date dimension table uh, to our um, to our database. Now, remember, I had that option selected earlier that, that included all future tables. Um, so this is a brand new table we've created. We've added a bunch of rows to it to kind of populate it with some some uh, some rows for our date dimension. And um, again, what you should see here in a moment. Save that. Uh, kind of the same thing, right? It, it should show up here as a new table altogether. Um, uh, real quickly, while we're waiting for that, I just jump back to because I actually thought I was going to have more time to talk about this earlier. Uh, a few prerequisites here. So obviously, this is Azure SQL database, uh, and it only works right now for Azure SQL database. There are a few other variants. Uh, there's a Azure, like it doesn't work right now for Azure SQL on VM. It doesn't work on an Azure SQL manage instance, and it doesn't work right now for at, or for SQL Server on-prem. All three of those things are on the roadmap uh, and should be coming uh, in some some time frame uh, soon. I, the the SQL the Azure manage instance uh, SQL on manage instance. Is first up. I think that should be should be coming very very shortly. Of course, the one that I think most people are interested in uh, as the, the biggest audience probably is the the on prem SQL. Um, there are a few other hit, uh, uh, hurdles to clear there in terms of kind of the networking back and forth and things like that. But but they have that is absolutely uh, on the roadmap and, and it's something that I would imagine will be delivered sometime in 2025 if I uh, understand the current roadmap. Anyway, so you have to have the SQL Server uh, Azure SQL Server. There are a few requirements in terms of what level you have to be at there. Uh, the one that I actually kind of stumbled upon, I didn't realize, um, is that it does have to be also in your same Azure tenant. Um, so um, it doesn't work right now if, you know, you're trying to mirror a database that, you know, belongs to one of your business partners or something like that. Um, there is a, there are a couple of options in your admin, in your Fabric or your Power BI admin portal that you have to turn on and make sure are enabled there. The the, the mirroring and that service principle one, um, uh, kind of kind of along the lines of the on prem stuff. It does not currently support some of the virtual networking or private network networking out in out in Azure. Uh, it does have to be kind of be available to the uh, to the internet for that to work. Uh, Gary, you mentioned earlier, ask if there's anything you need to do on your SQL Server itself. You know, other than making sure that it, it that it qualifies here based on the the kind of the the purchasing mode there's what they call a system assigned management identity um, that uh, you have to enable at the at the kind of the parent level or the server level uh, out there um, it's just a quick flag in in power I'm, I'm sorry in the Azure portal to turn that on um, and I mentioned already the um, the primary keys right so again it'll officially speaking, they will support tables that do not have primary keys, um, but my experience has not been great with those right now. So, yeah, I think it behooves you to go ahead and have primary keys assigned to those tables, even if it means creating your own like uh, identity index uh, kind of field. Yeah. Um, I haven't tried it with a with a, uh, a kind of a complex primary key across. Um, I think it should work. Um, the, the challenge on tables that don't have a primary key is that um, it's hard for it to keep track of what's a unique record, of course, right? And so um, uh, potentially, and again, I haven't tried this either, but potentially if you had a unique key on the table, uh, that might be enough for it to figure that out. You know, unique key spread across three or four or five columns, if, if that's the way that the, the data is associated. Um, so it, it, I don't think it requires a, well, I, it doesn't require a key at all, but, um, when I was playing with it, uh, just last night, I was, uh, I didn't have a primary key on my, uh, my customer table, for example, and it looked like what had happened is, is it, it kind of tried to generate some kind of a unique key for me. But then when I made a chain, like the, the alter a table statement, I think I ran a moment ago that kind of added a new column to it. Uh, it ended up recognizing those as all new records. So I had duplicates of all my customers and it was kind of a mess. So just uh, just kind of a, a word of warning to kind of try those out, play with it if you don't have a distinct primary key um, associated with it. Um, 
and I think we already kind of talked about this, but um, those are just kind of the three things you get right away when when you um, when you create that mirrored database. Uh, just gonna see if this clicked in here. There's our calendar. So our calendar uh, synced over as well. We add that as a new table. The only thing of note here is that um, when you add a new table, it doesn't automatically get pulled into your semantic model. Uh, I think you may you may if I, I kind of click through it quickly before, but um, you can click this automatically update semantic model and it'll pick up that new table for you. But really that's about it. It'll pick that up. Uh, you may want to create the, you probably need to create the relationship here. In our case, we'll tie it to the order date. Uh, single, but yeah. And that's all there is to it. At that point, that table is synced now too. It's part of our semantic model. It should be there in our Power BI reports if we want to pull it up uh, and use it that way. Um, let's see a few other quick things. Um, if we jump back out to our workspace level again, you know, you've got those three things that get created. Um, but in order to, to, you know, if we look back here at these various different workflows or workloads rather that, um, that we discussed earlier, a lot of what you do around data engineering, uh, data science, uh, typically involve pulling that data into a, into a lake house. Um, it's, it's really more of a structural thing, um, but just to show you what that kind of looks like, um, we'll just call that, um, Lake house. Again, we already, uh, we're just kind of creating the structure now. We already have all the data that we need. In our case, we can actually just point to those files that are already here. So we can just create a new shortcut. We're not ingesting any new data. We're not making another copy of this data. We're pointing to the data that's already in our one lake. So we'll connect to our uh, internal sources, our one lake. Just as a uh, as an example here, though, if you have these these files, these Delta enabled Parquet files, other places, if you've got some over in Amazon or or in another Blob storage account somewhere in Azure, um, you can connect to those as well uh, directly here. It just kind of creates a, a kind of a, a virtual shortcut to that data. So in our case, we're just going to correct uh, connect to that uh, worldwide or wide world importer uh, database that I just um, just synced over. Uh, we can pick which tables we want to pull in here. Just select everything, and um, and off it goes. And again, this is a kind of a similar endpoint to our SQL endpoint, but this is in our lake house. Uh, the difference here is that we can create uh, Spark notebooks and and uh, things of that nature uh, against this data. So if we wanted to um, create a new notebook here, we'll create. Uh, let's just open up our order table. Right, load data. Um, So uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with Spark at all. Again, we can write what essentially are SQL statements in Spark here to, to load into data frames. But this is a, a super simple example. But there, uh, there are a number of things you can do in a Spark notebook, primarily around um, some of your data science activities, maybe some of your data engineering. Um, we can we can start to layer on some AI and ML models um, uh, here in Spark as well. Uh, but what happens here and what it's doing right now is it's behind the scenes, it's spinning up a quick spark cluster to to uh, interrogate our data and be able to allow us to to visualize it and, and do different things with it here. But it's just one example. I mean, we can take the same data. Um, if we jump back out uh, here quickly. Uh, again, with the notion of that one version of the data, again, I just connected to it uh, directly from uh, uh, that that mirrored database that those parquet files are already out there. We created that shortcut to it in the lake house. We could do something similar in these um, these real time, what they call an event house. Now it's a KQL database, but you can essentially take the same approach where you you create one of those databases. You just point it to the parquet files you already have here, and that's great for um, kind of your time series analysis, your your real streaming data. If you've got sensor data from from an IoT environment, for example. Um, and you want to push that in, it allows you to write some queries that are more more associated with that. So again, that one lake, getting that data into that environment kind of underpins um, 
all of these other various workloads that you can you can layer on top of it. Um, let me just run through. I had a couple other slides here. So we kind of talked about some of these di different experiences that, that get unlocked here. We already showed off the, the direct lake mode and what that looks like. Uh, common questions. We talked a little around some of the CDC and kind of how that's different. Um, but again, a key point being here that they both use that transaction log, as I said, there's nothing to turn on uh, in the in uh, in your Azure SQL database in order to get this to work. Um, it is notable that you can't do both at the same time because they use that that transaction log and they use a lot of the same um, uh, methods to kind of keep track of what's been what's been uh, looked at, what's been transmitted over in terms of changes. You can't have CVC turned on and en enable mirroring uh, on the same database. By the same token, you can't mirror this database to multiple um, fabric uh, mirror data, uh, multiple mirror databases in fabric. So if you've got a different workspace and try to mirror it somewhere else, it's going to complain and says that it's already mirroring somewhere else. Um, but again, if you've mirrored it out to fabric once, you really shouldn't have to mirror it again. I mean, it's, uh, you've got the one copy of it that kind of um, violates that that principle of kind of that one version of your data uh, that you can use across various places. You can share it across workspaces and things like that. So that, that should be what you need there. Um, and then of course, cost. What are the costs associated with it? Um, nothing. Uh, this is, uh, maybe I should have started with this, but there is, uh, of course, the cost associated with your fabric environment. And you can start as low as one of these, what they call these F2 fabric uh, capacities. You can get into one of those for two or $300 a month. Uh, so real low end. Um, but they do not charge you at all for for the the amount of data that's flowing back and forth. Um, there is there are they do give you free uh, uh, to uh, uh, kind of like so the way that they price fabric capacity or the way they they uh, sell them. There's an F2, an F4, an F8, you know, kind of on up the, the chain. And at each level, of course, the cost doubles, the storage doubles, the compute. Uh, doubles all those things, but for an F2 you get two terabytes, for an F4 you get four terabytes, et cetera, et cetera. So you, there's a lot of free storage they're giving you even for that. I guess if you were to exceed that, they would um, they just start short charging you basically Azure storage rates, which are still really low. But again, there's there's no extra cost associated with you know I've got you know there's some question earlier about about the volume or the velocity of data if you're pumping out millions of rows an hour or something like that. One of the low end fabric capacities might struggle to keep up a little bit because again you're you're sharing compute over there um but they're not going to charge you more because because you you processed in a thousand rows last hour versus uh 10 rows last hour um they really want you to get all this data out here and, and keep it synced up uh, as best you can um so um again no uh, beyond the, the the traditional um or just the the base fabric capacity there's no extra cost yeah Well, if you've got one of those, if you're trying to get data out of one of those three systems that, that are that are available right now, Cosmos or Azure SQL Database or or, or Snowflake, yeah, I, I can't imagine why you would would write your own ETL process to take data out of those systems and push it over. I mean, unless you were hypersensitive to um, the load on those on those systems. I mean, we have, we've talked about SQL, but Snowflake. Uh, if anyone used Snowflake, Snowflake is a is a uh, the way they. They charge per query. So if you if you've got uh, you know not like some of the other things in Azure here in terms of the capacity, but uh, if you're writing a bunch of analytic queries against against uh, Snowflake, those add up over time. You you, you use up what, you're, what they call your Snowflake credits, and those you know there's real dollars and cents um, impact to that. If you instead mirror that over to SQL Server, um, I suppose there's probably some tiny little cost on on the Snowflake end to get those little transactions out, but you offload all your your analytic kind of queries to um, to fabric where they uh, you, they're they just kind of included in that base cost. So, yeah, I can't I can't think of any scenarios where uh, any other kind of scenarios where you would choose to write your own processes, your ETL process to take data out, on, out of one of those systems and, and push it over here. We haven't really talked about. I mean, uh, one of the other things um, I think it was on one of the slides a moment ago. 
cross data querying, across database querying, right? You could you could mul you could mirror multiple databases from different places. Maybe you've got a Snowflake database and a Cosmos database, and you mirror both of them in. And now I can write queries across those two databases that join tables from one to the other. You could also, if you think about what we call a, a medallion architecture, where you typically load it into your bronze environment, kind of as your staging area. This sync might just be your your staging for that that environment, and then your next step might be a one of those uh, data factory jobs that transforms it more into a traditional, let's say, star schema kind of uh, data warehouse into into fact tables and dimensions and pulls it in. But yeah, as, uh, yeah, I, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to use this to to take data out of one of those systems and push it over here. Um, and we talked a little bit about roadmap already, right? So additional sources. The, the first one there is that. Azure SQL managed instance, um, that one's coming very soon. I think that's already in private preview. In fact, I know it's already in private preview. Uh, they're working hard on the SQL Server on-prem one because that's the one they hear the most about. They get the most questions, most demand for, and that, that that's going to be a, a real game changer. I think when, when we're able to push that out because so much of our data is still in uh, in SQL uh, on-prem, and and to be able to take that data and get it that easily out into one of these environments is is going to be a big deal. SAP and Oracle again, they're they're on the on the list. I think I'm not sure um, what the uh, what the time frame on those are. Um, they're hoping to support more DDL operations, additional data types, those kind of things. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the primary key stuff, they're trying to do a better job uh, with the with the requirements there as well. That took longer than I thought it would. Any other questions? That'd be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I've I've been on some of those projects where we try to sync SAP data, and it's a mess. Of course, the thing with SAP, SAP's got a billion tables or whatever, and and they're all uh, so so. I, that is one of the other limitations. I don't think I'd stuck on here. Currently, it's limited to a maximum of five hundred tables uh, to to mirror, and so if you have more than that, um, well, I think well. There was that option to get us to sync everything that you probably just want to be more selective uh, with it. Uh, I don't know if that limitation will be lifted at some point, but that's that's where it stands today. Um, yeah. Um, if you had more than 500, you, you had one mirror database that did the first 500 and the second one that did, uh, I don't, again, I think you might run into that issue with, with it not being able to mirror to multiple places, but I don't know. I haven't tried that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that would look at that on a per table basis basis or a per database basis. That may be something you'd have to kind of play with to try out. I'm not, I'm not familiar. I don't know. But, um. So yeah, so I, I think this is a, a big deal um, just for the ease of, uh, again, for anybody that's ever written those processes that, that try to uh, just keep data uh, uh, synced up between your, your source system and your reporting databases. Um, it's not a lot of fun to do, for one. It's a lot of repetitive, just kind of boring, right? Uh, uh, and it, it seems fraught with, with, uh, with errors and, and just having, having to maintain and monitor all that. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot of work for what has always seemed to me like something that should be easier to, to do. And, and now they've made it a lot easier to do. Um, again, if you're trying to take data and, and eventually get it into more of a, and your traditional star schema format, or, or want to want to do other transformations, there's still additional work to be done. And you can do that out in, out in the fabric environment as well with some of those other tools. And, you know, maybe at that point that some of that work still needs to be performed on a schedule basis, um, you know, maybe now you can do it on a more frequent schedule than than nightly that I think so many organizations are kind of still stuck in. Um, and again, you, you don't you, you also don't have to do this. Uh, you, the, the data you expose to end users doesn't have to be uh, real time necessarily either. Um, you can you can again just use this as kind of your, your landing uh, environment and then and then do other things on a, on a more periodic basis. So you have but quite a bit of control over, over uh, what happens to the data once it gets here. We didn't even touch on the, the different permissions and sharing and security, but those those options are all uh, available for you in in one lake. But again, once you make this copy of the data, you can share that out um, as you'd like to any number of other uh, users or workspaces so that people can do other things with it. So.
Yeah. Good question. No, you can't. It has to be a table. Um, and I, based on the way CDC has always worked, I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So, yeah, you think about that, and, and maybe you've got a big orders table, and you really only care about the orders from the past year. Yeah, I, at that point, I think you're just going to. It, it probably still behooves you to go ahead and sync it, and then and then maybe clean it up once you get it over there, or, or write your Power BI uh, report such that it just kind of ignores those and something like that. But, but yeah, it. it yeah, I don't. I don't see that that changing because that would. I just don't see how the CDC engine would would work on top of that. So it does have to be a table, and and specifically it has to be a a standard SQL table. You can't be like an external table or some of the other various kind of archive tables or, or a couple of different things and that SQLs um, made available that that wouldn't qualify here as well. So anything else? All right. Well, again, this is really easy to, to get started. Uh, all you need is that fabric environment and that fabric environment. Um, if you don't already have one because of uh, be, because you had a uh, may have a premium capacity for Power BI, um, it should be really easy to convince someone in your organization to to buck up for a couple hundred dollars a month. Um, and I, if they say that, I think they're still doing free trials out there. Um, I'm pretty sure they are. If you haven't already signed up for one, uh, my, mine's already expired. But I think you can still do all this on on a trial basis. Um, think so you try it that way as well yeah so this is probably following the same model uh the, the rules like we have in the far via workspace is to grant people access to this right um of course anybody that has access to the workspace that we've created and put this in is going to have access to it but you can share it um with with other use you don't have to share the workspace with them you can share just the database itself or the or the the sql endpoint so um, at that point, people can connect to it like it's any other SQL, um, other any other SQL server, right? They just they, you give them a username and password. They connect to the SQL instance and something like SQL Management Studio or any other tool, um, and off they go. So, um, and you can even do some row level kind of security. That's a whole nother uh, session topic if we we get into that, and and that's still kind of evolving as well. And I think on the roadmap here, they even talked about some additional security enhancements, but. But are we able to still control their usage of this or implementation of this? Because I don't want somebody to run and configure a one db database and try to dump it in there and shut down your entire work. You, uh, one of the, yeah, I, we didn't have time to actually look at it, but um, in the admin portal uh, where you enable this thing, um, it's this database mirroring. And so, like any other, or like most other, Power BI features, you have the ability to turn it on for the entire organization for specific people or groups. So um, if you just had some of your, your you know, report developers or, or your data uh, people that you wanted to specify, these are the only people that can mirror databases. That's how you do it. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for your, uh, for your time today. Appreciate it. Well, I guess that were there any questions out in the um, 